Welcome to Industry Innovations, a new Oracle TV series where we talk technology, new business and revenue models, and share innovation, news, and insights. And all of that starts right now. Hi everyone, welcome to our brand new industry innovation series here with Oracle TV. I'm Kendall Fisher, your Oracle TV anchor, and I am here with Birchin Kaplanalu. Great job. Thank you, I've been practicing. Now, Birchin is our new Oracle TV correspondent and host of this new series. We're so excited to have you, Birchin. Thank you. Um, a few housekeeping notes before we get going with today's awesome event. Make sure that you use the comments to ask any questions that you have throughout today's conversation because we will be doing a live Q&A at the end of today's event. And hey, if you don't have any questions, that's okay too. You can always just give us a shout out. Tell us where you're tuning in from or tell us what you are excited to learn on this new series. And with that, Virgin, I think it's time to put you in the hot seat. What do you think? Let's do it. All right, so for starters, where are we right now? What is this facility and what is it used for? So we're in Chicago. This is Oracle Industry Lab. We built this as a simulated construction site in 2018. We opened in August and we've been testing, validating technologies with customers and partners. Then uh, two years ago, we actually built, start building this, this site. Um, this is a big facility in the same location, at the same location, and it is built as a test bed. And I, I saw before this, you were in a, a trailer right out front. This is way bigger than that trailer right out front. You've come a long way in the last couple of years. Well, trailer was our garage, right? Like a, like a little startup. So yeah. we started uh, in a trailer and have it still outside that turned into the big facility that we're in right now. Got it. Okay, so this is called the Industry Innovation Lab and the Industry Innovation Series. What industries do we focus on here in the Chicago lab? We focus on construction engineering, energy water, communication, public safety, and manufacturing. Do we have labs in other locations? We do. We have two other labs, and they're focused on different use cases. So we have one in Reading, UK, and, and one in uh, Sydney, Australia. And what industries are those focused on? So the one in Reading, UK, we have construction engineering, energy, communication, food and beverage, and hospitality. Got it. And the one in Sydney, we have construction engineering. Got it. Okay, so you say industry use cases. Um, for somebody who might not know, what does that actually mean? What are we actually doing in these labs? So one key differentiator is we are actually physically doing things. Okay. Let me give you an example. So if we want to pick a sensor and we want to embed into concrete and link it to a schedule, we can physically do it. It's really hard for our customers to actually try some of these technologies when they're running day-to-day -day operations. So this lab is built as a simulated site. It's not a demo center. We pick those use cases with them. We look at the business process. We look at the use cases. We figure out what technologies fits in, and then we physically do them. Well, if it doesn't work, we do it again. Mm -hmm. We do it again. Eventually, these things work, and they become commercially available solutions. So kind of zooming out of all this, I'm, I'm hearing you say all of this and I can kind of put the pieces together, but I'm going to ask anyway, how is this helping our Oracle community, our customers and businesses overcome their biggest challenges right now? Well, each industry has their own specific challenges, but overall, what we're really working on here is improving productivity, improving safety with the power of cloud, 5G and AI. So at a high level, we're really leveraging technologies, the skills of the people and the technologies kind of combined together to solve those problems. Okay, I got it. Um, this is, I mean, this is between the amount of industries that we cover at our different locations um, and the topics that you just hit. I mean, this is a lot of content, but we're going to cover all of this in this new series, right? Absolutely. So we're not going to lack content. That's one thing because <laughs> we have been working on this for years. We come up with commercial available solutions, some are prototypes. We also have drones, robots, things that our people are pretty interested to figure out. We've been working on different AI solutions. So kind of looking at this big picture, we're gonna provide fly on the wall in some ways, yeah. the work we do at the lab to the audiences. 
I love that. I love this idea of us kind of jumping in, like you said, as a, uh, our audience being able to participate as a fly on the wall rather than this kind of really heavily curated content that you often see with events like this, uh, you know, across different platforms. I love that. And I also love what, what our audience might not know is Virgin isn't just the lovely face of Oracle TV. He's actually an expert that can speak to all of this, which I think is going to bring, just shed so much more light and insight into these various areas and topics. So super excited about that. And how, how often are we going to be streaming and where are we going to be streaming? Where can our audience make sure to tune in for more? Well, we're going to be doing this once a month. We're going to pick certain use cases and have the audience actually experience them. And we are going to also have this in Oracle Connect. And so we're kicking things off right now, aren't we? Who's our first guest on today's segment and what will we be covering today? Well, we have our first guest today, Mohan Bersani. He is the Associate Dean of Northwestern Kellogg's Business School. Oh. His expertise is innovation, his expertise is business models. So we're really gonna talk about how these technologies change business models and what's really changing the environment. After all, technology is awesome, but we really will need to make sure that new business models come into our lives and we'll be able to generate revenue. Right, and like that you're set up for it and that it's not gonna be a business, a business model that doesn't work for you. Absolutely. Well, I'm very excited to learn from Mohan and um, I will actually be back with Mohan and Birchin at the end of today's segment. We're going to answer as many of your questions live with, with Birchin and Mohan. Um, so make sure you keep commenting to ask those questions. And again, if you don't have any questions, just keep shouting out, telling, tell us where you're tuning in from. And again, we will answer as many of you as we possibly can. And with that, Birchin, I'm gonna hand it off to you. What's next? Well. You're going to watch a minute video about what we have done last year. Meanwhile, I'm actually gonna walk out to our dry lab. I'm going to meet our colleague, Tiffany and Spot. Spot is the robot. She's doing some testing out there. So we're gonna talk about the technology, what it's used for. So this is another fly on the wall moment. So you'll be able to see what we're doing here. Then I'm gonna walk to the manufacturing floor and meet Mohan. So enjoy the video, we'll be back. Let's do it. Hi, Spot. Hi, Tiffany. Hi, Virgin. I see you're doing some testing today. Mm -hmm. What are you working on? Yes, today we're testing Spot's connectivity on Verizon's network. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So Spot is a product by Boston Dynamics. It has cameras at the front, it has cameras on the side, and it has a camera at the back. It uses cameras to map its surroundings. That's how it can navigate. We also have a LiDAR attached to it. What LiDAR does is it actually allows it to map even further distances. The future of autonomous operations, I personally believe, multimodal AI. What that means is you're going to have multiple data sources and AI will be able to make sense out of them. In this example, it's the LiDAR, it's the cameras, it could be RIDAR, and we are also seeing that autonomous vehicles are actually using similar technologies too. What I really want to talk about is this attachment. So this is a laser scanner. It's from Ferro Technologies. Three years ago, March 2020, we were under construction. This lab was being built. And Ferro Technologies brought Boston Dynamics Spot and its prototype attachment to the laser scanner to the site. Well, it was really interesting. Everyone stopped working. All the workers, even us, we all came to check it out. And it was really interesting to see 
the responses. Everybody was excited. They wanted to see what the use cases it can do, what the robot was going to do. But after a while, as we continue the prototyping, people got used to it. People got used to having a robot actually on the site. What we did is the integration of the laser scanner with the robot, but also management of the data in Oracle Smart Construction Platform. We're going to put this in the comments. You'll be able to check out that product. Robots are pretty hot topic. I did a post about friendly robots. Got over 2 million views on LinkedIn. And there were tons of comments. And it was really interesting to see how we all responded. There were some comments about excitement and you know, this is the future. And there were also some comments about you know, how scared people were. So I want to ask all of you, what do you think? I personally believe autonomy is going to allow us to do less repetitive tasks. It's going to bring productivity. It's going to improve our safety on operations. So yeah, please comment. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to walk on the manufacturing floor. And I see that Mohan and my colleague Eilish are actually having a conversation. We're going to walk there and really talk about use cases, business cases, and business models. Because the important part is technologies are coming into our lives, especially for industries. But we really have to figure out how new business models can actually come with these new technologies. Follow me. Hi, Eilish. I need to talk to Mohan for five minutes. Can I steal him? Hi, Mohan. Hi. Hi, Virgin. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. So currently, you are on our manufacturing floor of our test bed. And today, I really want to talk to you about business models, especially subscription models. Absolutely. So before we get to talk about that, I really want our audience to get to know you a little bit, if you can introduce yourself and you know, what you do for a living. Uh, sure. I'm uh, at Northwestern, where I'm the Associate Dean for Digital Innovation. And I also run the Center for Technology and Innovation. I've been there 30 years, and I study the interface of technology, innovation, and marketing. So I'm curious, uh, you know, when we look at these business models, why businesses are looking into business models to re-innovate themselves? Well, as you start to transform your business by using new methods of delivery, for instance, you're now delivering software over a network, that shift has to be accompanied by a shift in how you make money. And therefore, the business model shift has to accompany the transformation of your products and services. So when we talk about business models, which ones do you see as the most popular ones? One thing I'm seeing is an evolution towards subscription, because subscription really reduces your capex and makes it into opex. It also creates greater transparency and accountability for the vendor, um, and it's a pay-as-you-go model. I'm also seeing the evolution of usage-based models, more for infrastructure, the utility-type model, where you uh, use your, your charge based on how much you consume. Uh, and I'm also seeing the evolution of gain sharing or value-based pricing models. So subscription, usage, and gain sharing models. These are some of the innovations that I've seen. So I really want to focus on the subscription model. Mm -hmm. And in industries, we need to have hardware and software working together. Yeah. Most of us have subscription services for gaming, for shopping, other services. But when it comes to industries, you, know, you need to have hardware tied to it too. So when we look at that, can you think of an example that actually model has been successful? Yeah, consider, for instance, uh, a military drone you know, sold by a company like Textron. And this drone is used for surveillance over enemy territory. So the business model there is pixels over target, which is I pay you for the imagery. And I don't buy your drone, you maintain it, and, and so on. So in effect, I am subscribing to a service or I'm paying you by the transaction. So hardware, software, consulting is all wrapped into one. You know, we've also seen in a consumer realm, take a company like Peloton, where they used to sell the hardware, but they also had a software-based subscription service. Now they've combined the two, and for one subscription fee, you get access to the machine as well as the software. So I'm seeing hardware and software and information and consulting all rolled into one subscription-based service. Well, that reminded me a story I read uh, a few months ago, how vehicle manufacturers are looking to say, 
well, you know, if you commute to, you know, between two spots frequently, they'll be able to map it with the cameras, everything else. And one day they will be able to come and say to you, hey, Mohan, would you like to subscribe for the service? We will have assisted driving or autonomous driving for you for that route only. So you're subscribing it and you're gonna get the service. So um, when we look at these models, what are the benefits that you see people actually switching to subscription models? I think the benefits is first of all, you're paying for what you use. It's pay as you go, pay as you grow. There's also greater accountability because you can have SLAs, service level agreements, and you can monitor the quality of the service you're providing. Uh, and it also reduces the capital burden on customers because they're not paying for the equipment or the capital expense upfront. They can spread it out over a period of time. On the vendor side too, it's, it's helpful because now you have an annuity revenue stream. It's more predictable revenues. Uh, and as opposed to selling capital equipment, which is very lumpy, you have a much more consistent revenue stream. So investors like that, uh, you know, and, and it's a more predictable set of revenue. So I think it helps on both sides and it creates a more collaborative relationship between vendors and customers because you're now your interests are more closely aligned than it used to be in the traditional enterprise software world where you used to rely on upfront pricing or licensing. So can you give us an example from manufacturing? Yeah, so in manufacturing, assume that you're selling a pump Right, which is used in, say, a mine uh, to pump slurry. Now that pump, you're, you're, you're trying to optimize the performance and very importantly, you want to minimize the downtime. So imagine that I now put sensors on that pump and I start to create, a, offer you a service which not only includes the operations of the pump but also predictive maintenance, diagnostics and performance optimization. So I can see that done, for instance, in a, in a wind farm for a turbine I can see it done for medical diagnostic equipment. So any capital equipment in a manufacturing, whether it's an assembly line or a shop yep. floor, uh, two things that you can do is one is operations optimization, which is making your asset work harder and be more productive, but also preventive maintenance, which is preventing unscheduled downtime. So these are two really important applications uh, that we can optimized through a subscription-based service. Actually, that reminded me, we use algorithm named MSET2, which uh, detects anomalies on machinery and other things. But we also, like here at this lab, we have been using autonomous drones to capture data. And what we have done recently is rust detection. So, you know, right. especially in US, I can tell you this, our infrastructure has- It's rusty. <laughs> yes, rusty. <laughs> yeah. So we do need to automate the process and also do it in a you know, safe manner whether it's utilities, whether it's construction, whether it's a bridge construction. Right. So, you know, it's cheaper, it's faster. Most importantly, it's safer, right? Yeah. You don't need to have a bucket go down a bridge to take images or a human inspect. You can collect this data. But another thing that's coming from these models, what we're realizing is we don't need to have scheduled maintenance. Right. Right. So you can actually have maintenance the systems recognize and says, hey, you got to go and do They this. only flag the exceptions. So you focus on what needs to be fixed as opposed to having the person go out and visit all of the towers or all of the poles or, you know, the entire Absolutely. Time. And how about our most impo important asset, our health? Because I see that coming too in terms of subscription. How do you think that's going to work? I think that we are entering into an era where uh, you will be monitored continuously with a combination of sensors. Now you have sensors that can mon monitor your vitals, your, your, your blood sugar, uh, you know, peripheral arterial disease with smart socks. So with all of these, what we can do is really set up again, preventive maintenance for human beings. So imagine a situation where you have an elderly patient who is recovering or living, you know, by themselves. So today you have to put them in a nursing home, you have to have 24 by seven monitoring. But imagine that that monitoring was done remotely. So any exceptions were flagged so that nurses and doctors can be on call. So that way, one nurse can monitor maybe 20 patients, wow. while earlier you would have to have a one-on-one. -on -one. Plus, they can have live in the comfort of their home as opposed to being in a nursing facility. So I think that there's a huge potential, particularly for elderly patients with chronic diseases that need to be monitored on a continuous basis. It can dramatically lower the cost of care and improve the quality of life for these patients. Oh, that's really amazing. So I wanna summarize it. We said a lot of things. Can you summarize that, uh, you know, what problems subscription models uh, will solve? So subscription models solve the problem of reducing the capital cost of acquiring expensive industrial assets, yep. 
They also improve the predictability of revenues for the vendors and for the customers, they provide greater transparency, greater accountability, and they really align the interests of the vendor and the customer towards creating better outcomes. So one more question. So if I'm a business leader, I'm you know, listening to this, I wanna figure out how I could switch to you know, that business model, what should I be looking for? Well, moving to subscription is not just changing the pricing model. Consider the world of software, where if you are moving to a SaaS model, a subscription-based model, you have to re-architect the product. You have to, you have to allow for you know, joint tenancy, you have to allow for, you, know, you have to create a service operation that's seven by 24 by 365. Yeah. You have to improve the user interface, you have to create performance monitoring. So it's, it's a matter of not only re-architecting the product, but also changing the organization with the mindset of services. So it's a really fundamental transformation. And I would advise business leaders not to think of this mainly as a change in the way we price, but it's really a change in the way you do business. Wow, that's fascinating insights. Thank you so much. I also see Kendall uh, walking towards us. I think she's gonna have some questions. I know, I know. Time flies when you're having fun, <laughs> but I am back. And unfortunately, we're almost at the end of our segment today, but I have some questions that came in from the audience. I actually have been furiously writing them down so that I could ask each of you these questions. So the first one is for Mohan. Um, this one is coming from Serena in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. What are the pros and cons of setting up subscription-based business models? So the pro is that, you know, you get predictable revenues. I'm gonna take the vendor's perspective, right? You get predictable revenues, you get a closer relationship with the customer, you're more accountable, and you have to think much more carefully about how you create customer value. It's closer to customer value. The challenge is that now you have to absorb the capital cost, right? Because now you own the asset that they're subscribing to. Think about how many data centers software companies have had to create and the capital investment that they have to make. Yeah. Uh, so there's an upfront investment that you're absorbing from the customer's point of view. So those are the pros and cons. Got it. I, and I was, while you were saying this, I'm of course thinking, wait, so what about also the, what it takes on the back end to get set up? And that's actually our next question who yeah. came from, um, it came from Olga in Mexico City who says, if a business adds or changes in some way to a subscription model, what back end processes then need to change? What do businesses need to be thinking about? Infrastructure, right? Yeah. Because now you have to actually own the capital assets, yeah. whether it's a data center, whether it's equipment. Um, you have to create a 24 by seven service operation. Yeah. So because now you're not selling a product and forgetting it about, about it for several years, right. you're actually providing a service that has to be always on. So that mindset of always on is important. So at the back end, you need to create the monitoring capability, the service capability, yeah. uh, as well as the infrastructure and the capital assets that will be needed to provide the service. Yeah, that makes sense. Virgin, this one, uh, this one is coming for you. This is from Frank in Boston. Frank asks, how can we learn more about the work in which you're doing at the Industry Innovation Labs? Well, they can check our website. It is oracle.com slash innovation. Oracle.com slash innovation. We yes. got that. Yep. Well, that is all the time we have for today, Mohan. Thank you so much for joining us. And Virgin, you did a great job in your first Oracle TV correspondent segment. So congratulations Thank you. on that. Where can people go to learn more about what's to come from this series? Well, I would suggest people to go to Oracle Connect. We're going to put that in the comments. Okay, great. And for all of you who are tuning in, of course, thank you so much for joining us on our very first segment of the Industry Innovation Series. Um, and there's so much more where that came from, like Virgin said. So make sure that you give us a like, a follow, or a subscribe wherever you're tuning in from. And we'll see you later. Bye.